our lives are incredibly blessed. I don't know how much time you spend thinking about what, what blessings you have and what privileges that you experience. Uh, we are able to gather here this morning without threat of the government coming in and forcing us to worship another god. Nebuchadnezzar uh, enforced his religion on his people, uh, but we live at a place and a time when we do not have to live in fear of the government. And there are reasons that we should be thankful to live in the United States of America. Does that mean we worship the United States of America? Of course, we don't. Uh, we can appreciate our country without, wrecking, without uh, taking away from our primary allegiance to God. One of the ways that our country is uh, uh, celebrating or remembering uh, some, some things about our nation is uh, by recognizing uh, veterans who have served in the armed forces, in the military, in order to keep our way of life uh, the way it is. And so tomorrow uh, is Veterans Day, uh, a time to recognize those who have served. And I just want to take a moment also and say thank you to those of you uh, who have served in the military. If you would, if you have served in uh, any branch of the military, would you stand just for a moment so that we could uh, recognize and appreciate you? We have several. Thank you. Thank you very much for your service. Uh, if you have your Bibles, we are going to be in Daniel chapter 3 again this week. Uh, I finished reading a book this week called Seven More Men and the Secret of Their Greatness, uh, written by a guy named Eric Metaxas. Uh, it is a book of seven mini biographies. Uh, so uh, the book uh, covers the lives of seven different Christian men. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I uh, found several uh, to be very intriguing. Uh, in particular, this week, I read about Sergeant Alvin York. Is that a name that sounds familiar to you? Uh, I, I know growing up, I had heard the name Sir, Sergeant York and a little bit of, about, but I, I really didn't have a clue what his life was all about. One of the chapters in this book was on uh, Alvin York. Uh, he uh, was a man who served as a soldier during World War I. Uh, his unit had been given orders to go and to take a hill uh, that was heavily guarded and controlled uh, by the enemy. It was defended with snipers and machine guns. Uh, and as uh, Sergeant York, well, he wasn't a sergeant at this point, but as uh, uh, Alvin York and his unit proceeded to try and take the hill, uh, they were under very heavy fire. Uh, and as they tried to uh, move, move up and take the hill, many of the men uh, in uh, York's unit were killed. Uh, as, they, uh, as they were killed, York and a few others pressed on. Ultimately, they were able to take the hill and capture enemy soldiers. It really is an interesting account. If you uh, would take some time and, and read about his life, here was a, a group of uh, maybe six, uh, seven men who uh, were able to capture this hill, and somehow they managed to capture 130 of the enemy soldiers and take them back to be imprisoned. Uh, those numbers just don't make sense, uh, but it is... It is a, an amazing story uh, of what is going on. Uh, York, uh, later, after, after this battle, was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, uh, which is the highest honor that a soldier uh, can receive. Uh, and uh, in an interview afterwards, they, they, uh, uh, upper, the, uh, the, the military wanted to see, well, what, what was it that made things go your way? How did you end up uh, performing such an amazing feat. How did you survive when others died? Uh, and many uh, of the people who looked at the account thought that, well, it must, be, it must be because of Alvin York's exceptional skills as a soldier. The reason that they were able to take the hill, the reason he was able to survive, must have been due to the fact that he was a great soldier. 
But his response when he was interviewed uh, is telling. It is uh, interesting. I want you to listen how he responded when he was asked these questions. Uh, just maybe, maybe hear this. Uh, he was a, a country boy from Tennessee. Uh, and kind of, I, I may not get the accent right, but you, you, you kind of keep in mind, he's from Tennessee. He said, he responded when he was uh, talked about, and when they talked about these things, he said, it was not man power, but it was divine power that saved me. I'm telling you, the hand of God must have been in that fight. It surely must have been divine power that brought me out. No power under heaven could save a man in a place like that. Men were killed on both sides of me. And all around me, and I was the biggest and the most exposed of all. I have only got one explanation to offer, and only one. Without the help of God, I just could not have done it. There can be no arguments about that. When Sergeant York gave, gave a testimony, gave an answer to the questions that, that he uh, was asked about why things went the way they did, he did not stand up and, and say, it's because I'm a great soldier. It's because these other men were such great soldiers. He said, it's because God protected us in a time that didn't make any sense. He gave testimony to his experience of the power and the protection of the Lord during the battle. And he gave credit where credit was due. As I, as I read that this week and I listened to it, uh, it sounded very similar to what we read in Daniel chapter 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had experienced the power and the protection of the Lord. And we're, we're not going to read it in our, our reading today, but at the end of the chapter, Nebuchadnezzar himself says this, No other God is able to rescue in this way. And I thought York's words and Nebuchadnezzar's words, giving testimony to the power and the protection of God, were so, so similar. We are going to read in Daniel chapter 3, starting with verse 13 down through verse 24. Uh, we kind of read and talked a little bit about some of this last week in verses 13 uh, through 15, or 13 through uh, 18. Uh, but I want to go back and, and pick up a few things that we did not uh, read or talk about much last week. Uh, so, starting in verse 13, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. Uh, so they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, It is true, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up. Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace." And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king." And if not, but if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace." Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. 
Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Uh, last week, we began to look at some of the trouble uh, that uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego faced in a political environment that was not friendly towards a belief in the one true God uh, and with laws in place that mandated worship of other gods. They chose to stand and they faced consequences of their choices. And we read again uh, that the, the punishment for, the disobe- for disobeying the king uh, was to be thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. And we were asking the question, how should we respond in times of trouble? How did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego respond when they were put in this troubling situation? Uh, and we uh, said that they provide an example for us to follow Uh, In the middle of their trouble, what did they do? What guided them? What helped them in the middle of the things that they faced? It was their trust in God that allowed them, that uh, motivated them to stand strong on their commitment to the Lord. And we know, I want you to know today that God can be trusted in the troublesome times of your life. There's a book uh, written called The Knowledge of the Holy by a man named A.W. Tozer. And in this book, he says, What comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Uh, He goes on to say, Worship is pure or base. Uh, or think of uh, maybe not language we use a lot today. Worship is right or wrong. It's high or low. Uh, as the worshiper entertains high or low thoughts about God. Uh, As we examine this idea that God is a God who can be trusted in times of trial, uh, there's some theological questions that I want us to think about this God, this uh, God who rescues. Uh, so, in, as we are, are reading, have read through this passage, there's two points that I want to make today. Uh, first of all, uh, what, do you do, what do you need uh, in trouble? How do you uh, go through troublesome times? Uh, and I want to say that it's your personal theology that is going to guide us, it is going to guide you. Uh, the things that you believe about God are going to be uh, very influential in how you live your life. Whether you live in a, li- a life of comfort and uh, prosperity or whether you live a life of difficulty uh, and adversity, what you believe about God is going to have a very big impact on your life. Another way we might uh, say this, this idea that personal theology is going to have practical implications uh, for how you live. Uh, There's another way that I've said before, and maybe you'll remember, uh, what you believe is going to affect how you behave. What you believe is going to affect how you behave. Uh, We have seen so far in our study that we've looked at some different people and their beliefs about God. What came to their mind when the idea of God was mentioned. Uh, We read in chapter 2 about the the advisors to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, They had some thoughts when the idea of God came up. Uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar asked for an interpretation of the dream. What did they respond? They said only the gods could give the answer that Nebuchadnezzar was looking for. And they made the statement that these gods do not dwell with men. Uh, That they they had a personal theology that impacted the way they lived their life. Nebuchadnezzar is also uh, someone who uh, is impacted by what he believes. That his beliefs about who God or gods are uh, 
impacts how he behaves. Uh, as in this passage uh, here, uh, we're going to see a little bit about how personal theology has practical implications. Let's consider Nebuchadnezzar first of all. Nebuchadnezzar had low thoughts about God, and he had high thoughts about himself. Now, we are getting a little ahead of the game here. Really, in chapter 4, we really get into a place where we we take a deeper look at the pride of Nebuchadnezzar, uh, that that he is so filled with himself uh, that he does not think highly of God. Uh, And maybe we get a hint of that in chapter 3, verse 15. Uh, In chapter 3, verse 15, he says, Who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? I've uh, I've pointed out uh, so far through our study of Daniel that one of the questions that keeps coming up is this question, Who is God? And uh, it, is a, it is a major point, major theme of the book of Daniel to help us understand the difference between the one true God and the host of false gods that are out there. And Nebuchadnezzar being a believer in many different gods uh, and having a very high thought of himself, uh, when he asks this question, he doesn't just say, who is the God who is able to deliver you? Uh, but there actually, at the end of that question, there is, uh, there is something that he says that maybe we should place an emphasis on. And maybe we would read it this way. Who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Do you, do you catch that? Do you, do you hear that in him? Uh, he, in, in one way, is saying, what God is there? Is there a God out there who could stand against me? Can you hear pride in that statement? Can you hear pride in that question as he puts himself in a place as the one who is in control over everything? He sees himself as the highest and the most powerful. And he asks this question to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? He lived his life as if he was the, sitting on the top. He lived his life as if he was the one who was in control, in charge of it all. And, and he lived in this way. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, on the other hand, they had uh, different thoughts about God. They had higher thoughts about God than they even did their own personal safety when they were presented with this challenge that uh, when the music comes on, you will stop what you're doing, you'll bow down, and you are going to worship this golden image. Uh, when they got this command, uh, they, they, uh, they did not bow down and worship. They stood up confidently in their belief of the Lord. They had made a commitment earlier in their life to serve the Lord and no other God. And when Nebuchadnezzar asked this question, who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? We see in their response uh, that their personal theology was very important to them and it had a practical implication in their life. Uh, So not only did they not bow down, but then when Nebuchadnezzar called them in uh, face to face in front of him uh, and asked them, is it true that you will not worship my gods or the image that that I set up. Uh, they said, no, uh, we will not. And who is able to deliver you? And their answer was this, our God is able. The God that we serve is able to deliver us. And so they had a belief, they had a personal theology about who God was uh, that they had come to be committed to earlier in their life. It's, they said, our God, who we serve. Uh, so they, they had already made a commitment to the Lord and they wanted to share that they confessed 
to Nebuchadnezzar, our God is able. But there's something more to the statement that they make. There's something more to the actions that they had. Uh, They believed in the one true God. Because they believed in the one true God, they they would not bow down and worship other gods. Uh, And why? What was the reason for that? Because their belief about the one true God is this, is that the one true God is the only one who is worthy of worship worship, that they were not going to worship some false god. They were not going to bow down to some uh, false idol. Their personal theology not only was about God's ability, but about His worthiness to be worshipped. And so they stood in front of Nebuchadnezzar and they answered the question, our God is able, but even if He does not rescue us, even if He does not deliver us, we are not going to worship your gods. Uh, so faced with the question, who is the God? Or maybe if Nebuchadnezzar was asking, who are the gods that you will serve and worship? Uh, maybe that question is still good for us today. Are you going to serve God? Are you going to worship God alone Who is the God who delivers you today? Who is the God that you will serve and worship today? Like Joshua, I think we need to stand firm on the commitment. Especially you men, I think you need to stand up strong and say, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We need, a, we need a personal theology that has practical implications for the way that we live our lives. To be a Christian means that we're going to live a life that's different than the people that are around us because we worship, we serve and worship the one true God. There, should, there are going to be some things in our life that we're going to do differently than the people that are around us. Part of serving and worshiping God means that there are going to be situations that we are going to put in, be put into that are not going to be comfortable for us. They're not going to be uh, good for our reputation. They're not going to be good for our employment. They're not going to get us ahead in the rat race that we are in. But because of our commitments to the Lord, we need to decide here and now that we will be committed to them in spite of the circumstances, in spite of the consequences that may come. We all have a personal theology uh, that is going to impact our uh, life practically. The second idea I will bring to you this morning is this, is it's a progression in our theology, our, our theology that is going to grow us. Uh, and there's, there's a, a couple of things I, I want to mention as we look at this. So, so theologically, we, we talk about the idea of progressive revelation. Uh, progressive revelation that uh, uh, through the, the pages of the Scripture, starting in the book of Genesis all the way through the book of, of Revelation, God has been giving more and more information about Himself and about His plans. Uh, so uh, from the first pages of Genesis, God gives revelation uh, that uh, He has a plan for the ages, that there would be a child born uh, who would crush the head of Satan. I don't know if you realize it or not, but the Christmas season is upon us. And we are going to be talking more about this promised child. But starting in Genesis, all the way through the the law and the books of history and through the books of poetry and through the books of the prophets and into the New Testament, the Gospels and the Epistles and the Apocalypse, uh, we read about God's progressive revelation, how He has communicated more of His nature, more of His plans uh, to His people through the prophets and through the apostles. Uh, But this morning, I want to make a slight distinction that when we talk about having a progression in our theology, it's not quite so much the progressive revelation uh, as in we are receiving new information about who God is and what His plans are uh, as much as it is a progression of theology where we grow in our understanding. It's not necessarily that the information is new, but that we grow deeper in our understanding of it. 
uh, there is a, an example from science that maybe will help us understand this idea. And I believe uh, we, can, we can see it happening with Nebuchadnezzar. He's in process. Uh, maybe he doesn't get there in chapter 3, but, but uh, it, it's in process. Uh, this scientific uh, illustration uh, comes uh, from a time a few hundred years ago where uh, the, the common belief, most people believed uh, that our sun revolved around the earth. Uh, it's been maybe, maybe 500 years or so that this was the prevailing idea about science, that the sun revolved around the earth. Uh, and, you know, honestly, you know, uh, as we get up every morning and we observe uh, what's around us, what looks like it's moving? The sun, right? The, we, we, we say, even today, that the sun rises in the east and the sun sets in the west, right? And, and we, we don't look like we've moved at all. And so the observation looks like the sun is the one that's moving, and so many people uh, had this idea that the, the sun must revolve around the earth. Uh, but then there was a, a guy, a mathematician, uh, that stepped onto the scene and he began to, to explain from a, a, a mathematics position, which is way over my head, uh, but he began to argue, his name was Copernicus, he began to argue that the sun uh, was not revolving around the earth, but that the earth revolved around the sun. Uh, and uh, people in Copernicus' day, uh, they, they scorned him. They talked about how foolish he was. They, were just, they said, I've never heard anything dumber in my whole life. But we've come to understand uh, with uh, advances in our understanding of science, our understanding of, of the world, of the, the solar system that we live in, we do know that that's the truth now, that the sun uh, does not revolve around the earth, but the earth revolves around the sun. And this provides an illustration for Nebuchadnezzar, but also for us. Do you know you're not the center of everything? You know, we're born with this idea that everything revolves around us. I cry, somebody comes to feed me, change my diaper, give me something that I want. Right? As we grow up, we, we go through this process where, where we learn, hey, everything's not about me. And I think we see in uh, our passage that Nebuchadnezzar is in the process of learning that he's not as big and as bad as he thinks he is. He is not the center of the world. Not everything in the world revolves around him. Uh, and he is coming to grips with the idea that there is something bigger and something better than him. We need to have this perspective about God, that we grow in our understanding that, that, that he is the center and we are not. God does not revolve around us. He's not there to uh, just take our requests and make all the things that we want come true. He's not some big uh, cosmic genie. He's not some big vending machine that if we put in our prayer and push the button, he's going to automatically give us the things that we want. He is not here to serve us. We are here to serve him. There's something very foundational about our belief about God that we need to have a revolution in understanding that he does not exist for us. We exist for him. There is a foundational difference that we need to understand. And Nebuchadnezzar is in the process of going through this understanding of who God was. And he is growing in his understanding. In chapter 2, we did Nebuchadnezzar learn some things about God. He wants a, a, the revelation uh, in, interpreted. Daniel is able to say, hey, it's not me, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And Nebuchadnezzar is able 
able to say, uh, wow, your God was able to reveal when no other God was. He grew in his understanding of who God was. Uh, did Nebuchadnezzar then in chapter 2 get to the point where he was converted or he believed in the God who reveals like Daniel, like uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah did? I, I don't think he gets there. In chapter 3, we, we have this question. Nebuchadnezzar is asking, who is the God who is able to deliver you from my hands? He is now asking another question about God. He wants to know more, uh, really, about who God is. And when he asks this question, God answers him. He is going to show Nebuchadnezzar yet again that there, are no, there is another way that God is in control of things. God is over things, and Nebuchadnezzar is not. Uh, and so in this uh, uh, account of the, the three Hebrew children being uh, put into the burning fiery furnace for their rebellion against the king's command, uh, we read a detail uh, th of the story that, uh, that, that confronts us. And Nebuchadnezzar was confronted by the presence of God. He was going to be forced to grow in his understanding of who God was. And so as we read the account uh, that uh, after uh, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were cast into the burning, fiery furnace uh, and uh, with all of their clothes on, uh, and they, it, it happened quickly that they fell into the furnace. Uh, in verse 24, it says that King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished. Uh, this word astonished may, basically means uh, amazed. It means astounded. Uh, he was so surprised uh, that, that he just could not comprehend what he was seeing. And there, there were some things about that were going on that he was so dumbfounded, he was so amazed, so astonished, uh, that, that he began asking questions to try and make sense of what he was seeing. And the first question he asked is, how many? Like, he looks into the, the fiery furnace, he, he, and, and he begins to do some, some basic math. Um, I mean, can you see him going... I mean, he, he's, and then he turns to his advisors around him and he's like, check my math, <laughs> right? Check, check my math. I, didn't we put three people in the furnace? Yes, O king, we put three in the furnace. But he says, but I see four people walking around. They are unbound and unharmed. And this is something Nebuchadnezzar had never seen before. No doubt, none of the other government officials, none of the other servants, none of the other soldiers that were there that day had ever seen something like this. Uh, that people were thrown into a burning, fiery furnace, and now they were walking around where not even their clothes were being consumed. Nebuchadnezzar moves on from this question of how many to the, quest, the next question, who is the fourth in the fire? Who's the fourth person in the fire? And I think that's a good question for us to ask today. Uh, and uh, one very uh, important point for us to make. Uh, this is really a question of interpretation. Uh, as Nebuchadnezzar looked in, what did he say? I see four, and the fourth is what? So I read ESV, and my, the ESV says, A son of the gods. Okay? Now, some of you have a King James version of the, the Bible, and what does it say? I see the Son of God. Okay, we, we have a very important question of Bible interpretation. We have a very important issue to settle. Uh, so, uh, how do we understand who is the fourth person in the fire? Uh, and we, we need to ask a question to understand this. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar. What do we know about him? What do we know about his theological belief? 
He is somebody who believes in many different gods. He is somebody who does not believe in the, only in the one true God, but many different gods. So I would ask you, what do you think is more likely uh, that Nebuchadnezzar says that this is a son of the gods or the son of God? I, I think it, it really makes sense to believe that Nebuchadnezzar would say it's a son of the gods. It is a, 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 an indication of his polytheistic belief that as he looked into the fire and saw something he couldn't explain, he did not stand up and say, as uh, many uh, would today, this is a Christophany. Now, there's a theological word for you. Uh, a Christophany is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. Uh, that there are times in the Old Testament that we know that Jesus made a, a, an appearance to people. Uh, and uh, that we don't have time to really go into a lot of that, but we, we do know that he shows up in the Old Testament. Now, uh, so Nebuchadnezzar would be somebody who says, I see a son of the gods. Uh, but we as Christians reading the Bible, reading this account, we would read this and we would understand who the fourth person is in the fire, even if we wouldn't say it the same way that Nebuchadnezzar did. He said, I see someone who is a son of the gods. I think we have a lot of reason as Christians uh, from other places in the scripture to understand that this is the son of God. And so even though the, the, maybe the ESV and New American Standard, maybe some of these other translations are, are right in the way that they say that Nebuchadnezzar proclaimed that he saw a son of the gods, it is right for us to believe that it is the son of God. Are y'all following me? Are you picking up what I'm, uh, I'm saying? Uh, that in this, we, we have an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. Nebuchadnezzar did not have that information. He did not know who that was. He was just making his best guess about what he was seeing. There's more about what Nebuchadnezzar believed about God in our, in our uh, chapter, in Daniel chapter 3. It says uh, later on in, in verse 28, uh, Nebuchadnezzar says uh, that, God, uh, that an angel came and saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the fire. So we, here, here is another example that Nebuchadnezzar didn't exactly know what he was seeing, what, uh, what was in the fire. He, he says that it was an angel. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, later, as he calls uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of the burning, fiery furnace. Do you, did you notice how he referred to God here? He says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego servants of the Most High God come out. So Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2 refers to God as a God who has revealed. In chapter 3, he, he has said, who is the God or a God who can deliver you? He said, I see a son of the gods in the middle of the fire. And now Nebuchadnezzar is progressing in his understanding of who God is. For the first time, Nebuchadnezzar says, the most high God. He makes a comparison to all the other gods and he says, uh, he is the most high God. But no, does Nebuchadnezzar get to the point where he is saying, this is the one and the only God? Unfortunately, we do not see that here in chapter 3. But as we look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, whereas uh, Nebuchadnezzar was confronted, he was astounded, amazed uh, that there was someone else in the middle of the fire. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are comforted by the presence of God. Whereas uh, Nebuchadnezzar, again, he was challenged, confronted. Uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were comforted. Uh, when they were thrown into the, fiery, the burning, fiery furnace, uh, they no doubt had expectation of a painful death. 
They, they, uh, they were gra- when they were grabbed by those mighty men, those strong army men, to be thrown into the fiery furnace, you know, did they, did they have fear? Were they look, did their life flash before their eyes? Did they believe they were going to their death? I believe that they did. I don't know that they had a guarantee from God that they weren't going to be harmed in the middle of this. Uh, they believed in God's power to deliver them, but they, I do not believe, had the, the, the word from God that He absolutely would deliver them in the way that it is described in the passage. Uh, but when they get in there and they, they finally realize, hey, I'm not hurting. The, these ropes that I was tied up with are gone. And they look over and they see the fourth in the fire. We don't read this in the scripture, but did, did he say it's going to be okay? It's going to be all right. I got you in this. We don't know. Speculation. Pure imagination. (laughs) But um, they were comforted. They were comforted in the fire. They they come to to know something about God that they didn't know before. Experientially, they had experienced the presence of God like they never had before. They grew in their understanding of who God is. That God is not always one to deliver us from the fire, but God is one to be with us in the fire. They grew. They had a a progression in their theology that helped them to grow. I do want to take just a moment or two and ask a couple of personal application questions. Uh, It is uh, is kind of challenging to, to read a historical account Uh, and to make sure that we understand the history of what has gone on uh, and to to bring it into the modern time. How do we begin to allow this uh, this, uh, historical account to shape our lives today? We said last week, and we have repeated again this morning, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are an example for us that they were confident in their belief in the Lord, and they were committed uh, in their belief in the Lord. And we, uh, for sure, need to keep uh, doing those things, being confident and committed to the Lord. Uh, but one, uh, one question I would ask you this morning is, how do your theological beliefs affect your behavior How do the things that you believe about God, how does it guide you during the day-to-day things that you face? I don't really live with an expectation of being thrown into a burning, fiery furnace over my faith. But are there ways that my faith should guide me through the ins and outs of my everyday life? Is faith in God only for the big times, the big crucial moments in life, or is it for every day? Is it something that should give us guidance in every day? We have talked about this idea. Nebuchadnezzar did not believe in the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that he was the only God. We read that he refers to him as the most high God, but still sees him as one among many you know, we, we in our, our world today, we're, we're not accustomed uh, really to thinking about us serving idols. But we do. There are things in our life that control us, that consume us, and we worship and serve in ways that are just like God. And the question I want to ask you this morning is this. Do you only serve and worship the one true God? Are there other things in your life? Are there idols in your life that you are worshiping, that you are serving, that you are going along with the flow of the society and the culture around you? Or are you standing strong in your confidence and commitment to only serve the one true God? Will you make it your commitment like Jeremiah, like Joshua, like uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Will you make it your commitment 
to serve the Lord and to serve Him only? Will you worship and serve Him alone? Another question I would ask is this. Um, do you expect that God is going to be your servant or do you see yourself as His servant? Do you believe that God exists just to make everything that you want come true? Do you believe that God exists to make all of your wishes uh, come true? Uh, do you, or do you see yourself as serving Him? Uh, is your life under His control? Uh, are you the one dictating the terms of your life to Him? Or are you trying to live in submission to His Word? That if we really see Him as the center, if we really see Him as the King on the throne, and we see ourselves as serving and obeying and worshiping Him, then we need to bring our lives in compliance with the things that He has said and not put ourselves on the throne where we, said, this is, where we say, this is how it's going to be. And God, I expect that you make these things happen for me. And there is so much in our world today that, that, see, that uh, is being presented as Christianity that that's, that's what, uh, what the picture is, is that we are telling God what He's going to do and how He's going to uh, serve us, and that is just not the case. My challenge, my encouragement would, would be to you today is to allow your belief in the one true God who is at the center of everything, uh, that you make Him... Uh, you put him in control. You submit to him and his word. He is the one true God and the only one who's worthy of worship. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. God, we us to have the commitment of Joshua, to have the commitment of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of Daniel, and of countless others through the ages who have said, no matter what the cost is, no matter what the consequences are, Lord, we will serve the Lord our God. And that we will influence our families and our friends to serve the Lord our God. God, I pray for each person who's here today. God, I pray, Lord, that they would have a, a renewed uh, sense of confidence and a renewed sense of commitment in you. Lord, we do pray for the people who might be here today who have never trusted you as their Savior. God, I pray that they would uh, have the, the courage, Lord, to ask a question about how does this happen. Lord, that they would have the courage to come and ask uh, to talk more about this. Lord, we ask all these things today in Jesus' name. Amen.